Thanks uh, very much to uh, Waldemiro and Luis. This is a paper that is in the volume, uh, and, uh, but it's reworked a little bit, so it's not exactly the same paper. Uh, okay, so the talk begins with, in part one uh, of the talk, uh, the first part, uh, some thinking about what do we mean by reflection? What are, what are some meanings, some salient meanings uh, of, of the term? Uh, but then I'm gonna, I'm gonna settle in on uh, what, I, what I take to be a common philosophical sense. And then most of the talk is about what's the, what's the value of reflection, okay, in this philosophical sense. And I basically am going to have uh, two main points to make. The first point is negative. I'm going to argue against a epistemic uh, account of the value of reflection which, uh, or uh, actually uh, in any case a particular kind of epistemic account which thinks, which thinks that a kind of reflective thought is a general condition on knowledge or understanding or rationality or some kind of positive uh, epistemic value, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm wanting to reject that approach. And then I'm going to, the second, uh, the second point is to argue uh, in favor of uh, the social value uh, of reflection, okay? So, again, starting with, um, uh, starting with uh, some common senses of reflection. I looked up reflection in the dictionary and the uh, ordinary uh, English sense of reflection according to the Oxford English Dictionary is the action or process of thinking carefully or deeply about a particular subject. Contemplation, deeper serious thought, or consideration, and then it says, especially of a spiritual nature. They kind of threw that in at the end. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have that sense of reflection. Um, that that doesn't uh, resonate with me. That that uh, idea, but uh, certainly the idea that it's care, you know the the process of careful, uh, serious thought. You might reflect on the current state of the. Uh, uh, current state of politics, or you might reflect on your marriage, or you know, th th think seriously uh, 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 about something, and that's the common sense. In philosophy, uh, I think um, uh, at least one common philosophical sense is that reflection is self-conscious uh, thought, uh, thought that's both conscious in the sense of explicit thinking. Uh, and uh, self-referential, okay? And I think that uh, Luca actually um, mentioned the, the way he was thinking of reflection had that self-referential aspect uh, to it. It's thinking about, you said, critically thinking about your own thought processes, uh, uh, for example, uh, okay? Uh, and then uh, a cycle, the, 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 the sense of reflection that's dominant in uh, psychology um, uh, and, and cognitive science is that reflection is metacognitive activity, uh, thought that is self-referential, but not necessarily conscious. So for example, uh, uh, cognitive science talks about the um, sort of monitoring and regulating function of metacognition uh, which is usually a kind of background function uh, and subconscious. So it's, it's second order, it's, re, it's, uh, it's directed towards your own thinking, but it's not necessarily conscious. It's sort of going on all the time in the background. Okay. Uh, so what's interesting, uh, well actually I, I wanted to point out that this third sense of reflection, that it's standard in cognitive science, but it's also common in recent philosophy. So again, just the idea of um, metacognitive activity, uh, thought that is uh, second order or self-referential. So here are some common uh, philosophical volumes, uh, I'm sorry, recent uh, uh, philosophical volumes that 
I take it that's the sense of reflection in, in mind. So Keith Lair's Metamind, um, uh, Ernest Sosa's Reflective Knowledge, uh, Hilary Kornbluth's recent book on reflection, and, and John Quanvig's even more recent book, uh, uh, Rationality and Reflection. Uh, well, look at Quanvig's subtitle, How to Think About What to Think. So it's that uh, second order thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is how, uh, what's mildly interesting anyway, is how these three senses interact. So in the ordinary sense, reflection is conscious or explicit thinking, but not necessarily self-referential. You can reflect on anything. In, in, the, in the cognitive science sense, uh, it's self-referential, self but not necessarily conscious or explicit. And in the traditional philosophical sense, it's both explicit or conscious and uh, self-referential. Okay. So my question that I now want to turn to is what's the value uh, of uh, reflection in the traditional philosophical sense? So what's the value of uh, uh, conscious or explicit self-directed uh, thought. And two plausible ideas is that such thought is necessary, maybe even constitutive of rational agency and therefore human agency. And a related idea, if you think that flourishing has to do with an excellent exercise of agency, uh, then uh, such thought is necessary, maybe even constitutive uh, 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 of human flourishing. So I think that those are two plausible thoughts, but they don't get us very far because the question immediately ri ar arises, why should that sort of uh, conscious and self-directed thought be constitutive of human agency? Why should it be uh, necessary for human flourishing? And there we get uh, what I'm going to um, think of as the two main answers that I'll engage uh, in this talk. And I don't think they're the only answers, but these are the two answers that I'm going to engage. So the answer, the first answer, which I'm going to reject, is that reflection uh, in that sense is required for knowledge, or, or it's required for understanding, or some other positive epistemic status that is essential to rational agency and or uh, rational flourishing. Okay. So uh, an example of someone who might be attributed that view would be Ernest Sosa, who thinks that human knowledge, as opposed to mere animal knowledge, uh, the, sort of, the, the sort of knowledge that humans think is worth having, has this reflective aspect to it, this second order uh, aspect to it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to reject that answer. Um, uh, in favor of uh, the value, uh, the idea that the value of reflection is social. Uh, in slogan form, the idea is that human agency and flourishing take place in the space of reasons, and what reflection does is, is it helps us navigate and participate in that space of reasons. So it's a, um, it's a kind of um, uh, positive presentation or a positive version of the sperber mercier idea that um, uh, reflection is, is, is really at the service of giving each other reasons, not just for persuasion and manipulation, but for coordination and cooperation, recruitment into common projects, disclosure, disclosures of uh, self-knowledge, uh, uh, Etc. So um, it's it, it's not a it's not a kind of dubious or ill-willed uh, uh, giving of reasons. It's a um, it's a giving of reasons that's essential to a human form of life and, and human. So human rationality is basically social rationality. We think and act together, and in order to do that, we have to be able to give each other re our reasons and explain each explain to each other how we're thinking, why we're acting, uh, etc. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to have a grasp on our reasons. 
uh, and and so that's the that's the value, the social value of uh, reflection. So all of this is going to be in the context of uh, two puzzles um, that uh, I think have the function of problematizing the value of reflection in the sense of metacognitive activity or in the sense of uh, conscious self-directed thought. Okay? So one, one puzzle problematizes the idea that reflection is conscious or mu must be conscious or explicit. Why should that be a valuable aspect, okay? Um, and the, 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 the idea is that uh, we can make, we, we, so we can make a distinction between conscious and subconscious thought, and if we think of the various kinds of jobs that cognitive scientists and recent philosophers have given to second order thought, or second order thinking about thinking, uh, it's not clear why it should have to be conscious. So the kind of regulating and monitoring functions that say reflective knowledge adds to animal knowledge, in Sosa's view, can go on subconsciously. Right? If, uh, and and the, the sort of metacognitive activity uh, that uh, you see in cognitive science, in, important in cognitive science in some ways, again, there's no, there's no reason why it has to be conscious. So it's, as, as uh, Christopher Leppick writes, there's no necessary link between managing one's own cognitive behavior and doing so consciously. An unconscious process could, for instance, monitor the success rates of different problem-solving strategies, and initiate the one with the highest chance of success just as easily as conscious one. Thus, although consciousness may play an important metacognitive role, non-conscious processes appear to perform similar functions. And in fact, as Tomas was suggesting, you know, some of the cognitive science shows that once you make it conscious, you just screw it up, right? <laughs> it's that, that uh, uh, one reason why conscious you know, an emphasis on conscious thought might just be undermining of these sorts of uh, monitoring and, and um, uh, regulatory behaviors is that we only have so much uh, room. Uh, we only have so much uh, room for cognitive processing on a conscious level. So if you start adding to stuff that's, that's being done consciously, you can actually undermine performance. Okay. Okay. So that's the first puzzle. What's so great about consciousness in conscious self-directed thought? Um, here's, here's another, here's another a different kind of puzzle uh, about rational agency. Um, so on the one hand, human agency in general seems to require both conscious and self-directed thought. So the idea is it's almost impossible to imagine yourself as living the sort of life you lead and exercising the kind of agency that you exercise uh, uh, if it were not uh, conscious and self-directed, self if it weren't self-conscious, right? On the other hand, it's psychologically implausible to attribute conscious and self-directed thought to each instance of genuine agency. That would be like a hyper rationalization and intellectualization of human agency if you thought that each instance must be conscious and self-directed and actually consciously self-directed, right? So how can both things be true? How is it that conscious self-directed thought is a requirement of human agency requirement for one to count as a human agent at all, and yet not for individual acts of agency. Okay. In fact, it might seem that you can get an inconsistent triad of uh, propositions here. 
I don't think this is. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we do have uh, inconsistency here, but it's just like sort of sets the table as like a, something to think about. But this does look inconsistent, right? At least superficially. Rational agency requires both conscious and second order thinking. That's one. Rational acting does not require either uh, conscious or second order thinking. Rational, by rational acting, I mean both uh, intellectual activity and then action proper, right? So forming a belief would be a, a rational, uh, forming a rational belief would be a rational action. Uh, but so would rational action proper. So one and two seem right, but then it also seems that rational acting requires rational agency. But if you put those three together, uh, you, you come up with a contradiction. So the idea is that rational belief and action require rational agency, rational agency requires conscious and second order thinking, but rational belief and action do not require consciousness or second order thinking. So that's, you know, how, how does that, how could that be? Right. So the point of uh, the point of um, putting these two puzzles on the table uh, is at the service of defending this account of the social value of reflection uh, and uh, in the service of rejecting uh, the epistemic account. Okay. So the idea would be that an adequate account of the nature and value of reflection ought to resolve these two puzzles and I want to argue that the social account does. Okay. So here's the remainder of the talk. Uh, the first part we'll look at the value of reflection um, and argue that it's not for knowledge, understanding, or rational belief, um, or some other kind of really any positive epistemic value that might be associated with human flourishing or with rational agency. Uh, the second um, part argues that, that it is re re reflex reflection is social, the value of reflection is social, and it's uh, tied up with this thinking and acting in the space of reasons idea. Okay. Uh, uh, and then once we look at that, we'll be in a position to resolve uh, the two puzzles about conscious thought and, and rational agency. And then I want to, just because I can't resist, I want to uh, look at whether this social value of reflection motivates internalism or evidentialism in epistemology. Because somebody might think, oh, now we have a motivation for internalism. Now we have a motivation for evidentialism. Rational agency is in the space of reasons. Those reasons have to be accessible so that we can give them to each other. Oh, that's internalism. That's evidentialism. You know, that's what's wrong with reliabilism, etc. And I want to say, no, 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 no. That, that's not, that's not going to fly. Okay? So... All right, so that's, the, that's how it's going to go. Uh, okay, so um, what about this idea uh, that the value of reflection is not for, for knowledge or understanding or rational belief or some other positive epistemic status? Well, here's, a, here's the, the uh, schema for this sort of view. That S is belief that P has some valuable epistemic status V only if S has some belief about S's belief that P. So any position that can fit into that schema would be an example of the kind of position I'm trying to uh, reject here. Okay. Uh, so for example, uh, you've seen this before. Uh, uh, S's belief that P is justified only if S believes she has good reasons for believing that P. So uh, many of the early um, uh, critiques of reliabilism uh, as a theory of justification basically insisted on this point that justification requires that you not only have good reasons but you consider yourself to have good reasons and so that would be an example of putting a metacognitive condition on justification. Okay? Uh, we've all seen this one, S knows that P only if S believes that her belief that P is reliably formed. Uh, uh, 
and again, that's putting a metacognitive requirement on uh, knowledge. Another example of a metacognitive requirement that's very familiar in philosophy is the kind of thing that has been uh, um, variously defended by Richard Fumerton, uh, Robert Audi, um, I'm sure others as well, but the idea that you're justified in believing P on the evidence on evidence E only if you believe that your evidence supports P. That would be a metacognitive activity uh, requirement on a positive epistemic status. So the idea is that these are all over the place, right? This isn't like uh, uh, this isn't a, a kind of rare view uh, of the requirements for positive epistemic status. However, uh, I think there are two kind of problems that arise for any such view. So one has to do with psychological plausibility. Uh, is it psychologically plausible that the metacognitive requirement is satisfied in every case that we want to say is justified belief or every case that we want to call knowledge? And usually the way that people address that is to say, well, the, bel the belief can be unconscious, or the belief can be implicit, or you know, they, they sort of tamp down, weaken the requirements on uh, uh, belief. But notice there's a kind of dilemma there for that kind of strategy, right? Um, so uh, uh, on the one hand, we, we thought that there was some reason that this requirement exists, right? They, 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 on, 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 on the one hand, the theorist thinks that, well, you know, it's not really justified, it's not really knowledge, it's not really rational if it doesn't satisfy this requirement. But then when you push back on the psychological plausibility of the requirements, well, well, it's implicit, it's subconscious, and it gets so weak that she's wondering, well, how, how is it, if it's that weak, how does it do the job it was supposed to do? You know, why do we need it in the first place? So there is that kind of dilemma for any kind of position. But I think a much more a uh, stark problem uh, is that any such requirement issues in problems of circularity uh, and regress, okay? And I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly because, you know, everybody here, I'm sure, is familiar with these in the history of philosophy. Uh, but um, take, for example, the principle uh, defended by Chisholm and uh, uh, many others in the history of philosophy that S knows that P only if S knows that she knows that P. Okay. Uh, consider, if all, here, here's like just a quick rejection of this position, okay? Uh, if all knowledge that P requires that I know that P, then that same requirement applies to my knowledge that I know that P. Thereby generating a requirement that I know that I know that P. Likewise, it applies to my knowledge that I know that I know that P, and so on ad infinitum, but on the assumption that knowledge of such increasingly complex propositions is impossible for me, it follows that I do not know that P for any P, even for example, I know my own existence, right? Such a requirement would issue in an infinite re regress even on my knowledge that I exist, okay? So notice that one thing to notice here, which is, which, which is sort of a common feature, what, what's really uh, generating the problem is the universal, the universality or the general nature of the requirement, right? It's, it's only if we think that all knowledge that P requires that you know that P that, you, that the regress will get going. So this doesn't count against the value of some second order knowledge, it doesn't, it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't count against the value or possibility of self-knowledge or knowledge of one's own thinking, etc. What it counts against is putting any kind of general requirement on some positive epistemic status or another that would, would issue in this kind of regress. Okay. So here's a general dilemma for metacognitive requirements on positive epistemic status. So all the ones that we were surveying before and, and any other one that fits that schema, okay? So for any second order requirement 
on any appropriate first order cognition, one may ask whether the second order cognition must be likewise appropriate, right? So take the example for, for take for example the idea that, well, I can't know that P on the basis of evidence E unless I at least believe that my evidence supports P. Okay, that sounds like a really benign requirement, right? But in fact, it leads to an infinite regress, okay? Because you can ask, well, what about your belief that your evidence supports your first order belief? Does that have to be justified? Well, if you say yes, you're in trouble. <laughs> because now you've got a requirement for a third order belief about your justified second order belief. And now you can ask again, what about that one? Does that one have to be justified? Right? So here's the dilemma. For any second order cognitive requirement, you can ask whether the second order cognition must be likewise appropriate, whether it must be likewise justified or known or reasonable. Or If the answer is no, then the second order requirement will seem unmotivated. Why is this a requirement for appropriate first order cognition but not second order cognition? Right, and that's that's actually a, a, an, uh, an example that's been raised. Uh, uh, that that's actually a uh, uh, an objection that's been raised against Sosa's notion of reflective knowledge. Right? Why does animal if animal knowledge requires a second order perspective on the reliability of your first order cognitive processes? Why doesn't reflective knowledge require a third order perspective on the reliability of your second order processes? And so is his answer. We can talk about this in, in, uh, in the discussion, if, if you like, because it's not clear what Sosa's answer is. Sometimes his answer is simply that, well, it's just, you know, it's, it's good as far as it goes, but human psychology is only uh, um, as good as, you know, maybe third order at most, if you're like in a really clear frame of mind. Uh, and I wonder if that, I wonder if that, kind of answer falls into this, is captured by this sort of dilemma, right? So anyway, if the answer is no, you know, uh, well, then what motivated the requirement? And if the answer is yes, then you'll generate that analysis requirement at the third level, etc. So, uh, and that's going to just go on for, for subsequent levels, uh, and therefore, uh, any second order cognitive requirement on appropriate first order cognition is either unmotivated or entails an infinite grass of higher order requirements. So, for, for homework or discussion, is Sosa's reflective knowledge captured by this dilemma? Uh, and I, ask, I know that a lot of people here are familiar with Sosa's work, so I thought it would be a good group to raise that question about. <clears throat> so one problem having to do with a general requirement of reflection or a general second order or metacognitive requirement on positive epistemic status is psychological plausibility. Do we actually have that? And then a second one is these familiar skeptical arguments that lead, that you know, point to regresses and circles. Um, Hilary Kornblith, in his book on reflection, in which he takes a lot of the recent cognitive science literature from the rationality wars and sort that that sort of throw shade at uh, the, the value and, 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 and the uh, efficacy of uh, reflective thinking. Um, Hillary Kornblith raises a, a, a third problem uh, for such a requirement. Um, and the way he puts it is that reflection can't do the job that philosophers want it to do. And well, what's that job? Well, it's some sort of critical function 
that will check mistakes and improve performance, right? And Hornblith's argument is that reflection just isn't cut out for that job. And his first consideration is sort of goes back to our dilemma. He says, well, suppose reflection does guarantee, say, the reliability of perception in a particular circum set of circumstances or conditions. Well, what about reflection? What guarantees reflection, right? So you can just raise the same question about reflection. So that goes back to our dilemma that we just reviewed. But, the, but, but then the, th the second sort of problem uh, is that, uh, as, 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 as Kornbluth puts it, um, there's nothing especially accurate or reliable or otherwise epistemically powerful or impressive about reflection. So that's another reason why it's just the wrong kind of thing to do the job. Um, so I think these, these are the, the, the kind of qu questions we're raising about uh, system two sort of considerations. It, system two is not that great. You know, it's not that it's it's not good at all. It's not that it doesn't have its useful uses and its purposes, but it's no. You know, it, it's not like it's it's like that's the real jewel of human cognition, and so we should use it to make sure all the other stuff is 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 going well. So again, just the idea that well. Reflection just doesn't do this sort of guaranteeing, critical, uh, vindicating job uh, that philosophers want it to do. Okay. Okay, so that ends my critique of the first sort of um, approach, say, the first broad approach to explaining the value of reflection. And so now I want to turn to uh, a completely different approach, which is that reflection has a social value. I think that um, uh, both approaches, the um, epistemic approach uh, and the social approach, can be seen as tying the value of reflection to the value of human agency and human flourishing. Whereas the first approach is sort of an unreflective life isn't worth living, right? That's sort of the spirit of the epistemic approach. An unreflective life is not worth living and that's why, you know, you know, human agency is rational agency and rationality of the kind we want requires this sort of epistemic stance. Um, I think the social approach can also be seen as tying the value of reflection to human agency, rational agency, and in particular human flourishing, but it, it, the, it, it's not so much an epistemic flavor as a social f flavor. So it's not just that we're beings who are capable of knowledge and understanding, we are social beings. And as social beings, it, it, it's built right into our nature and our way of life and, our, and the ways that we flourish that we think and act together. Okay. And in order to think and act together, we have to make our thinking and the reasons behind our thinking and the reasons behind our action explicit to each other. Or in order to make it explicit to each other, it has to be explicit to ourselves. Okay. So the idea is that, just sort of an elaboration on, on that idea, to be coherent to oneself, one must be able to grasp her own beliefs, desires, intentions, etc. Thus, I, 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 I must have an ability to grasp why I'm doing something, why I'm choosing some way rather than another way, why I believe one thing rather than another. <coughs> 
uh, so to be coherent to myself, I have to grasp the reasons behind my own thinking and behind my own acting. Okay? And to be coherent to others, we have to be able to report our beliefs and desires and intentions that are driving our thinking and our acting. Okay? So this kind of metacognitive grasp on one's own mental states is plausibly a condition on rational agency in general, both intellectual and practical, but it's even more clearly a condition on social agency, which involves the ability to cooperate intellectually and practically, to plan, to coordinate, to execute and evaluate cooperative activity. Okay. So in short, social agency is partly constituted by the abilities of participants to plan, coordinate, execute, and evaluate cooperative activity and metacognitive activity is essentially involved in all of those tasks. Okay. On a very sort of common level, we can't really act and live and cooperate together unless I can ask you, why are you doing that? And you can give me an answer. Or, how do you know that? And you can give me an answer, right? But that requires a metacognitive grasp on our intentions, our beliefs, our evidence, uh, etc. Okay. So it requires that metacognitive grasp, but it also requires conscious metacognitive activity or ex a meta activity that's explicit to ourselves. Insofar as one must have conscious access to one's mental states in order to employ them in rational explanations of belief and action. So when you ask, why am I doing that? Why do you think that? I'm giving you a rational explanation. In order to do that, I have to be conscious myself of what my reasons are. Okay? Now, one might object that non-human animals are also social, some, right? Some non-human animals, I'm talking about like bees and dogs and et cetera, right? Uh, are social in a sense that implies coordination and cooperation and, but, and they manage their social lives without citing their mental states in explanations to themselves or to their cohorts. But this objection misses the point that human social agency is also rational agency. It involves rationalizing one's thoughts and actions by means of giving one's reasons. Uh, in other words, by means of overtly giving one's reasons uh, to oneself and to others. And so that's the seller's, you know, space of reasons uh, idea, okay? So our social account of the value of reflection also explains why reflection need not extend to all our reason-related mental states, need not itself be exceptionally reliable, and need not improve on first-order cognition uh, in any significant way. Um, so in other words, the social account avoids the pitfalls of the epistemic accounts. So one of the pitfalls of the ex of, well, really all of the pitfalls of the epistemic account goes back to this very, the, in, uh, an entirely general requirement on, of second order thought on first order appropriate thinking. And it's that general requirement, the, the, the complete generality of the requirement that one leads to problems about psychological implausibility and two leads to the regress and circularity problems, right? But the social account of the value of reflection doesn't issue in any such general requirement on all first order cognitive activity. That's because um, the need to give explanations citing our reasons, whether to ourselves or to others, arises only on some occasions. Uh, uh, moreover, this kind of metacognitive activity can tolerate the same kind of fallibility that we experience in cognition generally. So it doesn't have to be the crowning jewel of human cognition that vindicates all other human cognition. It just has to be as good as 
human cognition in general. It doesn't matter if I'm somewhat fallible or somewhat, or, you know, maybe often deceived about why I'm acting for in a particular way or why I believe a, a certain thing. He'll tolerate the same kind of fallibility that all of our thinking tolerates. Right. So now, um, the next thing uh, I want to do, just because it came up, is think a little bit about um, how this view re relates to this, the Sperber and Mercier view. Um, I, I, I have just some notes on that. I was going to leave it out of the talk, but I'm, I'm going to just throw it out there and maybe we can make progress on it in uh, Q&A. So here, here's my understanding of the Sp Sperber and Mercier, Mercier position. Their, their thesis isn't explicitly about reflection. Their thesis is about the function of reason. reason. And by reason, they mean reasoning. And by reasoning, they mean giving one's reasons explicitly. And I think they even say for the purpose of persuasion. Okay. So, so their question is, um, what is the function, not what is the value, but what is the function of reasoning in that sense? So reasoning in their sense is the so social activity of giving one's reasons for the purpose of persuading people, right? Uh, and they're asking what is its function, and they're asking that in the sense of a function that you see in like evolutionary biology. It's the, the question is like, you know, why do we have this uh, uh, capacity? So, um, and, and, and uh, the, the way that you answer that question in evolutionary biology is you give an explanation for why, um, why that trait helped ancestors to survive. How did that trait, um, how did that trait contribute to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, how did it contribute to? Survival value. Yeah, what was its survival, survival value, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, it, and its survival value uh, basically gives you its function, okay? So the function according to them uh, is that, um, you know, the, the, the function of reasoning is persuading others, uh, uh, recruiting others uh, into uh, cooperation, um, getting them to do what you want them to do, uh, uh, etc. So, I mean, the, the way that they put it, it it's, it's almost like a dark thing. It's like the, the, the function of reason is manipulation, or the function of reason is persuasion, for the purpose of manipulation. But I think that we can give it a much more benign or even virtuous spin, right? Because we can think of the way in which exactly that kind of activity, giving each other reasons for both to believe something and, 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 and to act on something, uh, is at the service of uh, cooperation and coordination. Right? That's, that's, that's the root of human social life, uh, is to um, uh, recruit for cooperation and coordination, but also to figure out together what we should believe or how we should act. Right? So I think that very often uh, it's not, I mean, in some ways their, their view is still very individualistic. Right? It's me trying to get you what I want you to do. But, but think of it differently, right? Think of it that as human beings, as social animals, we often have to think and act together. We all, and we, we have to get on the same page. And so giving reasons for why we should think one thing rather than another, or uh, giving reasons for why we should do one thing rather than another, can be thought of as um, uh, uh, a rational uh, 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 activity in a virtuous sense of, of, of rationality. This is, uh, okay. All right, so if you take that view, 
We can now return to uh, the puzzles uh, about conscious uh, thought uh, and rational agency. Um, so remember the puzzle about conscious thought. Uh, it, it was um, uh, basically what's so great about conscious thinking, right? Um, it's not at all obvious why reflection should concern conscious thinking in particular rather than just any kind of thinking, conscious or subconscious, to do the sort of monitoring, regulating, vindicating activities that philosophers and cognitive scientists assign it. Um, it's just a current thinking rather than conscious thinking that is needed to do the various jobs that reflection is typically assigned. So this approach, this social approach resolves the puzzle. Uh, metacognitive activity need not be conscious to do its self-monitoring or self-evaluating jobs. Nevertheless, my reasons, intentions, etc., must be consciously available to me if I am to report them to others. Okay. Uh, it is thus the social function of reflection, uh, those that involve coordination and cooperation with others, that explain the value of conscious metacognitive activity uh, in, in, in particular. Okay. So, uh, similarly, the, the puzzle uh, about rational agency was this. Uh, on the one hand, conscious and self-directed thought seems essential for the sort of agency that characterizes a human life. On the other hand, neither dimension can be required pervasively uh, on pains of both psychological implausibility and vicious regress, okay? So how are we supposed to think about this? How is it that conscious and self-directed thought can be required for rational agency, but not for particular cases of rational acting? And again, the puzzle is easily resolved on this view Human agency, and especially social human agency, requires appropriate participation in the space of reasons, and that in turn requires capacities for conscious and second order thought, so as to have one's own beliefs, reasoning, desires, intentions, etc., available for reporting in the context of social cooperation. But although participation in the space of reasons requires that one have such capacities, and also that one exercises those capacities in appropriate ways, it doesn't require that one exercise them on every occasion, or even on any particular occasion, of genuine agency. So we can see our actions as uh, manifesting genuine rational and human agency, even if we don't have a general requirement that everyone is accompanied by conscious, self-directed thinking about the reasons behind the action. Okay. Uh, accordingly, one status as a participant in the space of reasons does not issue in the fully general requirements that we saw give rise to skeptical problems involving infinite regress, nor does it motivate requirements that are psychologically implausible for agents like us. So, I, I, I do have this last section on, um, you know, does this somehow motivate uh, internalism or evidentialism in epistemology? But I think I can go, I, I think I can go through it pretty quickly. Uh, my paper in the book goes through it very carefully and maybe a better word would be tediously uh, because it's not like, it's not rocket science here, right? The, the idea is that the, let's just take internalism first, but it's basically the same argument for evidentialism. So. Uh, so internalism has this accessibility requirement on one's evidence, right? So that um, 
let's take privilege access internalism, which says that, uh, at least on some versions of it, uh, the grounds of one's thinking, or the grounds of one's uh, belief, say, has, you have to have privileged access to it. So, so the idea is that uh, if we think of beliefs being based on evidence, the evidence has to bottom out in uh, grounds that we have a kind of privileged access to. Privileged access is usually thought of in terms of what you can know by reflection alone, meaning by introspection, uh, or by just a priori um, contemplation. Um, so that the, 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 the obvious point is that that um, internalist requirement that in effect uh, positive epistemic status supervenes on that sort of uh, grounding, uh, that's a much stronger requirement than anything that was just argued for, uh, anything that this social account of the value of knowledge would require. Okay? So uh, the, the, e even if you accept all of the, everything I said about the social value of reflection in terms of being able to give one's reasons, that's a much weaker thesis than what uh, internalism and epistemology requires of our reasons, okay? Um, similar for, for evidentialism. Uh, uh, evidentialism is roughly the position that all knowledge or all justification uh, must be grounded in some kind of appropriate evidence. And the way that Feldman and Connie put it is again in a terms of supervenience. It's a supervenience thesis. So that uh, knowledge or justification, whatever it is your target uh, value is, uh, supervenes on uh, your evidence base. Another way to put it is that the positive epistemic status or really just the epistemic status of your beliefs is exhausted by what evidence you have or don't have. Okay? That's a much stronger thesis than just the idea that sometimes you have to be able to give your reasons <laughs> for what you believe and, and, and what you think. The other, uh, so, so it's a much stronger thesis in that sense. There's another sense in which it's a much stronger thesis. Um, we shouldn't we shouldn't equate evidence in the evidentialist sense with reasons in the space of reason sense. Okay, so to see the point, uh, take um, perceptual beliefs. Say, take take the um, perceptual belief that uh, Chris Christo, Christoph uh, Chris Kelp was uh, uh, Kelp. No, no. Um, there's, there's, two, there's two philosophers, there's Christopher Kulp and there's Christopher Kelp, right? We're talking about Kelp, right? So, um, uh, let's take the um, perceptual belief that he's, he's uh, eating breakfast uh, in, in the restaurant at the hotel. Um, the evidentialist has to give an evidentialist account of the justification of that perceptual belief or that perceptual knowledge and the way that it's got to go to be an evidentialist is you've got to identify like what, what's the evidence for that belief and of course it's going to be in terms of sensory experiences, right? Um, similar, okay, how about, the, how about my memory belief that he was at breakfast this morning? That, okay, what's the evidence for that? Well, now we have to start talking about memory seemings or, or, or something like that because you've got to identify something that's going to count as the evidence for this memory belief, okay? I don't have to be an evidentialist to operate in the space of reasons here. If I say, Chris was at breakfast, and you say, why do you think that? I can just say, I saw it. You know, I saw him there. Or, you know, was, was Chris at breakfast this morning? Yeah, uh, how do you know? Oh, I remember, I remember, he was there, I saw him there, right? I'm not an evidentialist, I, I could be a reliableist and say that, right? So to give my reasons is not the same as to give my evidence uh, in the evidentialist sense. 
uh, it's just to cite a reason in a much broader sense of why do you think that? Okay. Okay. Um, so, no help to the evidentialist or the internalist here. Okay, thank you. <laughs>